This Can conference I? will now be recorded. There we go. There goes the record button. Thanks for that. <laughs> Um, so um, my discussion tonight is an extension on the paper which you may have seen in the last journal in I think I believe it was October. I'm going to talk through the developments in switching and crossing over the last uh, year or so. Um, I've only been with Network Rail since February since I left TFL um, since I did my stint in the US and came back in um, sort of November December last year. Joined Network Rail in February on the Intertrack 2 program um, alongside Philip Winship and um, Melanie Denley. Um, so this paper is really gonna discuss um, what uh, research we've been doing within the SNC area, uh, part of the European research and mainly through the collaboration with, with the universities. Um, you'll see some of those from the UK you recognize and other ones. And also some partnerships with some of our suppliers um, who are involved with um, Intertrack 1 and 2. So I'm just going to tidy my screen up because I've got lots of things to decide here. It's better. Um, so um, we're going to look at how Shift to Rail is developing a new technology in a reliability focused manner and a collaborative approach. Um, the issue here is, um, well, what is it that we're trying to solve from a research standpoint? What are the benefits for the research? Um, what will be the impact of this research to the railway? And what are the actual developments or demonstrations that we're actually introducing as part of this next generation s &C? OK, um, so Starting from um, the actual design for reliability side of things, um, our reliability concerns um, were within Shift to Rail. So Shift to Rail project is um, a project of many consortiums. It's um, currently at Intertrack 2 stage is one of the projects we're looking at, which then goes into Intertrack 3. I'll show you the timeline in a, set, in a, um, in a few slides time. Um, but one of their main key performance indicators will be a 50% improvement in reliability over the next 10 years. Um, enhanced and next generation SNC. So we have two work packages within that. Um, enhanced SNC looking at the next 10 years, next generation SNC looking at the next 40 years. Um, and that's considered to contribute around 5 to 10% towards achieving this KPI. So other um, aspects will be signalling, infrastructure, trains, freight, and so on. So they're all aggregated. Will will give you give you a fifty percent um, increase in um, improvement in reliability. So previous designs um, and research into this topic were short sighted and they weren't system focused um, because of their short durations. There just wasn't the time uh, and resources available to spend on producing something this in depth. So some of these projects have started in 2014, 15, and into track three will be carried on until 2023. So it's quite a large time frame and um, time span in which, in fact, there have already been some um, technology demonstrators and technology improvements that we're already either embracing or bringing to the next next level. And also today, maintaining a reliable railway as well as a safe railway is, is monitored more closely. So we've got improved data gathering, we've got better statistics and so on. And the, the process we're really using for um, for shift to rail and into track two is, is we're looking at the failure mode analysis for the current SNC systems. We're removing those failure modes by design. Um, and then we're evaluating those designs, demonstrating their reliability improvements. So I'll take you through one of the sections of into track one and two. Um, S code was introduced in into track. Um, it stands for Switch and Crossing Optimization, Design and Evaluation. Um, these are the partners, we've got University of Birmingham, Loughborough, um, RSSB, um, names you all know, and Monberg Cerse, you know, from the UK. Um, some of our overseas partner from Bruno University. Um, we've also got Parviz, uh, Comsa, um, and DT as well. Um, University of Birmingham led this. It's a total budget of five million euros and it was completed in 2019. So to, to technology readiness level three to four. I'll explain what that is in a second. 
Um, so the timeline of the projects for the shift to rail um, projects here. So on the, the bottom here, we've got technology, technology readiness level one through to nine. Um, we're currently at the stage of intertrack two, which is at TRL level five. Um, TRL five is really about technology development. We've passed the stage of um, proof of concept, POC, um, and we're starting to now look at the technology demonstrators, how we demonstrate the technology, how it works in the field and in the environment. Um, so within shift around the follow-up research activities, um, go up to 2022, we then feed into Intertrack 3, which then lasts to around 2023-24. Um, you'll see TRL 8, the readiness level 8 and 9, so that's really when you're looking at deploying into a market, so you're making it market ready. So into track 3, we're, we're, we're thinking ahead of how we can make these things market ready, but it's really about testing it in its environment for into track 3. Just a bit of a whole picture for shift to rail and all of the various, um, I'd say, assets and infrastructure pieces that are within this. Now, I've circled the bits that track is really looking at within IP3, which is the work packages one to four. So we have enhanced SNC, next generation SNC, um, uh, enhanced plane line track, and next generation plane line track as well. So we, we'll be able to look at the better, more value for data, number four here. So we've, we're quite a data rich environment at the moment, but we're not doing a lot with it. So we need to improve that. And how can we cross map data and, and analyze data better using different algorithms and bringing that straight from source and looking at where we bring that data from as well. And then going on to 11, low cost rail solutions. So part of the shift to rail KPI is to reduce life cycle costing by 50% over the next 40 years. So that's one thing we'll be looking at. And number 12, accelerated research, development and technology deployment. So that's that's overarching on everything, really. But you'll see some of the other parts that are part of the other infrastructure um, projects. Um, so um, I think number one is we get running trains closer together. So we have virtual coupling um, and small headways. Um, we've then got minimal disruption of train service, which is a, an obvious one. Um, but then efficient passenger flow through stations and trains. Um, other areas looking at that capacity for rail and um, a lot of the um, InterSmart is looking at a lot of the data transfer. Intelligent trains. Now, what can we use the train for? Can we use the train to measure stuff? Can we um, uh, apply measuring um, uh, equipment on trains as well, so we can harvest data better and, and um, you know do things things more. So that's that's just an overall picture and the track is a very small part of that within that whole shift to rail um, uh, strategy. So back to switching crossing. So how do we look at this from a from a reliability point of view? So um, within network rail we did some research into switching crossing failures and we found that it can account for uh, over 15% of track track and signal infrastructure related service affecting failures. Portions of which, um, or some of the track related causes are also within SNC, um, but aren't correctly coded as a, a, what I'd say, a failure code. So we can't always get accurate information on this. So this information isn't accurate, but it gives us the best stab of, of knowing how much um, failures are contributed um, by SNC. So you've got the purple section, the, the blue purple section there, sorry, blue section there, 19% is plain line track, and then 15% is SNC there. Um, so it includes POE, SNC, heating, and so on. But some of the tracks are, the plain line sections will fall into that because it could be um, a root cause from plain line. Um, and there could be some other things from track circuits as well that come into, that are related to POE as well. So exploring the root causes of the failure, um, helps us to understand the real issues. If we dig deep, deep, um, deep uh, sorry, dive deeper into this information, then we can pull out what the real problem is, whether it's by design, whether we're not collecting the right information, we're not, we're not inspecting it the correct way, um, or the data can actually be of no use. We're actually getting wrong data. So for, for SNC, we, we built this boundary diagram to look at 
how the system works. So within this track system boundary, we have the intersecting rails. So these are sort of colloquial terms for us to see. The closure rail, rail fixing, the movable rail, the guidance rail. And then we've got the supporting layer, the bearer, um, any resilient layer we might have. We might have under, under bearer or under sleeper pads. And then the ALD or what's the, that's actuation lock and detection or what's also known in this country as POE, point operating equipment. Uh, ballast or ballastless support, we're looking at both, um, and then the sub ballast layer. So, from above, we have um, external influences from power, traction, vehicle, signal communications, and below, underneath us, we've got the drainage seeping our water away and carrying the water through, and, and the support structure as well. And some of the failures we look at um, that affect us are frozen points or um, uh, that could be frost or it could be snow in points. Um, within the bearer, we've got loss of fixity, um, loss of integrity, movement under load. Uh, within the rail section, we've got rail wear, cracks, breaks, and even the uneven surface. So it's not just about um, something that could affect the strength of the rail, but there could be an uneven surface, a, a vibration causing point equipment to, uh, to fail. Within the actuation lock and detection, we've got multiple different failure modes. Um, it can be adjustment, it can be other things, mechanical obstructions causing it. Um, so it can be failure of the components within the point machine or, or any of the sort of actuation system. Uh, ballast degradation causing loss of geometry. So that's that's poor top. Um, starts normally with geometry with sorry with the the ballast, but something is going to trigger that ballast, whether there's voiding, whether there's a subformation issue. Um, and substructure support. So if we have poor substructure support, that will find its way up to the top. Um, so the outputs of the research that we're doing for, for shift to rail. So this presentation was mainly about reliability. Um, so I'm going to focus on how we're designing for reliability and how shift to rail is going to in, improve the reliability. Um, then later on, towards towards the end of these slides, we'll just go more into some some of what the developments are and, and what we're actually covering for the technology demonstrated. So uh, we're moving from a progressive enhancement of SNC. So at the moment, it's just trickled and improved as we've gone along. So we can now start to look at some big step changes in development for whole system designs. So where we can apply a whole system design approach, we can start from scratch from one. So some of this is horizon scanning, it's it's future thinking, it's new technology we're bringing together. Um, um, but we always revert back to what we know and love with, with switching crossings. Is it a movable switch rail? Is it a fixed crossing? Is it a bearer? Um, is it a point loaded system? So a point supported system or is it a continuous supported system? So it's all various different ways of, of supporting the structure. Um, so we're utilising and adopting advanced analytical and manufacturing techniques from other leading industries. Uh, we're also looking at damage mechanisms to better understand where design improvements are to be made and failure modes reduced. So certainly with um, metallurgical examinations and, and um, uh, on the, uh, the steel side, we're looking at a lot of damage mechanisms on that side. And we're also introducing a, a fault tolerance and intelligent control systems to operate the switch. So if we can make something um, have some high redundancy or, or some fault tolerance in the system to, to make it more reliable, then let's look at introducing that wherever we can. This, uh, this graph on the right hand side just shows you from 2015, which is roughly the start of shift to rail and some of the intertrack work. Um, where we looked at the conventional switch and where we are today as a baseline and how technology develops over time to 2035, where we'll have high performance actuators or point machines, intelligent control systems, so we have super fast switching um, and reliable switching, um, self-healing, looking at self-healing concrete, self and point machines that can machine learn as well. Self-inspection and um, repair technologies we're also looking at. Here's a snapshot of um, one of our demonstrators. So this is from VARS, which is Vostalpine Rail Systems. They used to be VAE. Um, so this just gives you an idea of where various different improvements are being made. I'm not going to go into each individual area because I do that later on as we sort of dissect the switch panel and the crossing and where we're improving stuff. But 
But looking at it as a whole, from the bearer, the rail, the fixing, the point operating equipment, the, the remote condition monitoring within the point equipment, um, additional monitoring where we can look at movements within crossings and bearers and switches and so on, longitudinal movement of switch rails, um, residual stresses within rails, all these other sensors we're looking at to combine and have an intelligent system. So this is actually the technology demonstrator that was installed in Vienna uh, last month um, by VAE under OBB. So I'll go through some more details on that later as well. Whole system diagnostics and prognosis. Um, we have Relinium and Birmingham University and various other um, universities looking at how we can better use monitoring devices. Um, so designs including self-monitoring with embedded sensors uh, and smart combined analytics. So, so we're not just looking at one single sensor, we're looking at multiple sensors. We're looking at the train-borne sense, train-borne monitoring, um, autonomous inspection using drones uh, and autonomous repair, embedded passive dynamic effect monitoring around switches. So you could be using various different accelerometers or, or potentiometers to look at crossings and how they behave. Um, fault tolerance within point machines and embedded actuation monitoring but also combining all of these together. So if we can combine them and produce um, what I would call a proper health monitoring system, you can then look at the combinations of three or four different sensors to tell you when it's about to fail, and not just looking at it from one sense at the moment. At the moment, we tend to, with remote condition monitoring for point machines, just look at you know current draw, um, which, there's a lot more to it than that. What's the track doing? Is the track moving? Is the is the crossing seeing a lot of problems? Because we concentrate on the switch area because that's a failure mode, which is reportable and, and we get penalized for. But crossings, um, we've done some research on the actual costings, and crossing for us is one is one of the highest problems we have where we have degraded crossings and worn crossings and the cost to repair crossings. Um, so we need to monitor them better and we need to understand their failure modes better. We need to get in there and predict and prevent a lot better. Um, so we we're monitoring track condition in terms of reliability as well as safety. As we all know at the moment, we've got safety condition um, being done by most of our measurements we do, but let's supply reliability threshold to that. Let's see what reliability will throw up. So it'll be, you know, uh, a level further down, but the alarm bells will start ringing for reliability long before safety. The benefits for the railway that this project will introduce, so one, one of our big ones is a reduction in life cycle cost, better value added benefit, um, reducing degradation models as well to accurately predict intervention and replacement timescales. Considering the environment impact, reducing carbon is a big drive for us. We've got our new 2050 carbon um, rule now where we're reducing carbon uh, by 2050. We're going to be net, car net free for 2050. Um, noise and vibration as well. So that's noise and vibration for our, our uh, passengers and also our uh, neighbours as well. And also not to mention the, the harm it does to the track. Um, and this project really gives us the ability to trial innovations to a high technology readiness level so we can bring it in to the environment and bring it and, and test it in, in, in a track situation, a live track situation. Uh, we're establishing the key requirements and the parameters for building switching crossings that belong in the future. So we're establishing sort of mean time between service affecting failure target levels um, or best practice. So we're bringing that all around from, from the rest of Europe so that we can see what works best in all the countries and, and what's the best method to, to deploy. Uh, and then we have the co collaboration with the, all the European infrastructure maintainers, as I suggested, yet certain suppliers and the academic experts within various universities and research companies. Um, so we have around 30 partners working within Intertrack 2. Um, varying from all different um, areas. And some of those are from different um, transportation organisations as well. Um, so anything that we can bring into SNC, we're, um, we're looking in all, all areas. Um, and having the funding for thorough research, top down and bottom up, we're going both ways on this because we realise that in some cases we need to see what we've currently got and how we can improve that further. Um, and being able to demonstrate the logic and the added value, that's the biggest thing at the end of this project for each of our proposed 
designs, we need to be able to demonstrate that it does add value and it is a benefit. Uh, otherwise, it just for us, it just won't be. Um, um, it won't. It won't meet our main goal, our main objectives. So who will feel the impact? Um, I don't know why I put that photo in there, but may, maybe later on a few people can give you some captions on that one. I suppose we just don't expect to see a, a kitten on the railway, do we? Playing with a train and causing delays, but yeah. Um, so from, from feeling the impact, it's our passengers, our freight transportation companies. Um, they may give us a lot of pain, but we give them a lot of pain back. Um, reduced number of staff attending site, so where we can um, use autonomous inspection, uh, reducing boots and bars, of course, is, is what people are referring to. Um, improved asset information for our asset stewards, better information, better informed, better maintained. Um, and reduction in whole life costs for all to benefit as well. So from a design and development perspective, I'm going to take you through the S code project. What um, the S code project um, came up with a few a few suggestions, which will take a board into Intertrack Two, and then I'm going to go through the Intertrack Two developments and the Intertrack Two demonstrator as well. So this picture here is the Intertrack Two demonstrator installed by VARS in Vienna, um, and I'll go through that in more detail in a bit. So apologies if some of these make some funny moves because some of them are animated and are, they've been given to me from other people and I'm not too sure where they've actually put the animation in, but yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> so under S code, uh, they had over a hundred different concepts that they had to evaluate and then take forward. So they used this Pew matrix approach to do that. They came up with some concept selection criteria on the left hand side. Um, some weighting, so we put some weighting in it in terms of how you can then score all those concepts and um, so that we can then uh, decide what can be taken forward. Um, so some of the concepts we looked at, um, so some of them are switching concepts, so we're looking at how we bend, maybe bending stock rails, bending switch rails, vertically moving switch rails like the repoint system, um, flange bearing systems similar to what they use on trams, active steering within vehicles and um, SSC that steers actively with the vehicle, um, actuated noses, swing noses, um, which is which has been around for quite a long time. But but what's what's the next technology going to do for, for for swing nose swing nose crossings? Sliding panels, so that's where the whole switch panel will slide or bend into place or move into place um, uh, so that we can um, change routes using one whole static panel. Um, it does introduce some butt joints, which is a concern, but um, um, they looked at that. Pivoting rail for crossings, uh, overrunning of crossings. Some people might look at that and go, that looks very similar to an unbroken crossing, but yep, yeah, that's probably because it is. <laughs> um, single switch rails so that's one switch rail that just slides from from left to right um uh, which is used a lot in mining in some sort of light rail tram system um, but it's an interesting concept now, some of these are actually out there today on tram systems or or um on mining system mining rail systems so some of that technology may be over 100 years old but what can we do with it in the future is it actually a good idea why did we steer away from it well why are we with our conventional two switch rails and two stock rails at the moment? Um, so that's that's where Birmingham started with this and it's, it's sort of progressed from there. Um, and the gap filler, um, there is an actual system out there at the moment that uses a gap filler system that blocks the flangeways. So you're then having, you're forced to uh, the flange onto certain areas, so. One of the um, demonstrators or one of the um, subjects that they're looking at I knew you would do that, there you go, um, was fault tolerant control. So just sort of explain what fault tolerant control is. So here they're demonstrating it on this graphic user interface or what you might see on the dashboard and it's been developed using um, MATLAB. Um, so this sort of showcases how you can use algorithms um, that execute the actuation of a point machine. And if you were to have four or five different sensors within the point machine, and currently if one of those sensors fails, then it might say no go, um, and then you, the train can't proceed, so you've actually locked up the signaling system. But if you use some fault tolerance in there, so that if there's missing gaps, missing information, 
but then coupled with an additional sensor or an additional way of actually sensing that it's in a safe position, then you're not masking the problem, but you're actually telling it that it is still safe. And I've got a secondary system that's telling me it's still safe to go. Plus, by using algorithms that are based on if that sensor saying it's there, then this one's got to be there. So it could be a faulty sensor. So it's how you get around faulty sensor systems. Um, I won't go into any more information, but, but Birmingham have studied this, uh, Birmingham University have studied this, and um, it's something we're actually using in one of our demonstrators for into track three. So we're going to use this in one of our point machines. Um, um, so really the conclusion there is you, by using the response from all the three sensors, the fault tolerant control algorithm patches missing information that can lead to a failure. So redundancy can also be included by using secondary detection and control devices so we can have something that's more reliable within the point machine. Right, it's might, this might be quite difficult to read and I'll skip through this so, because work package one is um, with Interact 2 is quite um, a lot of work going on, a lot of work packages. Um, uh, the items in yellow that are highlighted are the network rail items, and we're doing some of those with Birmingham, University of Birmingham, Sheffield, <coughs> Railinium, um, SNCF, um, to name a few. Um, the items in blue are VAE or VARS, so that's the technology demonstrator, they have partners, Getzner, who do the undersleeper pads, uh, Kirschdorfer, who are their concrete bearer supplier, um, and OBB, who are the installers, that's the Austrian infrastructure company, OBB. Um, so we've got, just quickly scanning through, near field communication, RFID tagging, that's for sort of train positioning within track recording vehicle traces. Um, embedded or surface mounted sensors within crossings and bearers, handheld scanners for profile scanning of switches and crossings, uh, friction management, uh, got low friction and hard wearing switch rail coatings, um, and looking at how uh, we can reduce friction as well to reduce flange climb derailments. Uh, and then there's a validation that network, network Rail are doing on those concepts as well. Um, we've got the validation of the actuation lock and detection re remote condition monitoring system that VAE are introducing, which is a new system they're introducing. Um, we've got a link to a digital twin that's being developed for plane line track and SNC. Um, so a digital twin is really a 3D representation of the track system um, with a with more asset information within there, such as profile information. Um, and some very sort of key uh, measurements and, and um, critical measurements of, of where it should be alignment wise and um, rail condition wise. Uh, and then there's the manufacturing and the demonstrator, um, which we're doing with, with VAE. And then the, the, the last part really is about validating that demonstrator um, and using some degradation models and so on. And SNCF are also demonstrating uh, a new uh, cast manganese crossing within a new coating um, as well so that's part of this work so that's just an overall work package one so a work package one is really about um, enhancing SNC so it's looking at SNC today and then enhancing it uh, uh, over the next 10 years for work package two uh, work package two is about uh, next generation SNC and this this is actually a 40 year um, horizon scanning um, piece of work so we are thinking outside the box on some of these things certainly with the the way we move switches and, and so on and um, we are um, and I'll take you through so yellow again is the items that network rail are, are managing myself and Phil are managing next generation system integration and there's the digital twin <clears throat> um, we've got autonomous repair inspection I'll show you a slide on that later it's quite an interesting piece of kit um, we have Atachi helping us with advanced tolerant control systems. Um, Cranfield University looking at whole system design for SNC. And then we have Huddersfield helping us with our next generation crossing designs. Um, got a few slides on that later. Um, and we're also looking at SNC components um, uh, and transition zones, which um, Ben from Network Rail is helping us with with Huddersfield as well and Rail So. There's a sort of a, quite a few people involved in that one. 
and the asphalt track as well. So asphalt track is one of the demonstrators that Ben's been heavily involved with. Um, and at the bottom, we've got uh, Voslo Kojifa doing um, modular continuous support for S&C, which is quite an interesting one. They're mainly focusing on the fastening system because there is, under the plane line track, a modular continuous support system they're looking at um, for plane line, but this then brings it into the S&C side. So I know Jan's on the um, call, so thank you, Jan, for these slides. Um, I'm going to do my best to relate them. Um, so um, IRR through Huddersfield, uh, working a lot with you with our within our Ukraine framework. Um, that's the sort of the the framework for rail research, um, where we're using the universities and other academic areas. Um, and um, Jan's been looking at switching crossing R and D for. Our, well, before Intertrack started, really, in some cases, I think it was capacity for rail and other areas. So they've been looking at rail damage, material, wheel rail interface optimization, um, and support also the whole system stiffness as well. So looking as a whole system. That's capacity for rail, inter rail, Intertrack. Yep, multiple sponsors, as you can see. A lot of this does merge into one, actually. You'll find that. Um, um, some of these systems may have started in capacity for rail and then gone into interrail. So um, a lot of them have found their way into, into track two now. And we hope those that succeed and, and, are, and are good to go forward will go into inter track three. So that's our, our, our phase at the moment is deciding what, um, what stuff should go through to inter track three. So that's the main, the main goal for us in the next month or so. So Jan sort of described, I guess, the, there's a bit of a roadmap for crossing uh, um, development here. It started back in 2006 with the NR60 nose and wing profile, our EPW design. Um, and it's really spanning over the years in 2013 where EDH, explosive depth hardening, was introduced. Then there was the NR60 Mark II Thirsk um, technology demonstrator. And that's really as part sort of stemmed into from capacity for rail and into a bit of in, into rail and into track so in this red circle at the top here i've highlighted the sort of the the see those three areas in blue um that's sort of the european funding work going forward to into track two um and they're also looking at the inset inset switch design so optimization of inset inset switches as well and the next phase really is to apply um, the lessons learned from the geometry changes of the crossing, so the NR60 Mark II crossing profiles, the ramp, the wings, the um, wheel transfer areas, that's been highly optimised by lots of vehicle simulations um, and applying it to the sort of casting, casting design. And next stage is really to look at how we can apply that to NR56V designs, so that's your sort of 113 pound 56 designs. Um, some conclusions from the simulation work that Jan found. Um, so I think the key driver for all is crossing damages, the damage to crossing um, needs to be care carefully considered for design improvements. The wide range of wheel shapes, we're always scratching our heads over what wheel shape to use and what, what model to use, what load case to use. Um, it's always a bugbear for us and, and something that I know Jan and, and Huddersfield are working on to try and adopt, adopt a, a, a common piece, setting a benchmark for vehicle modeling, model, modeling, so vehicle simulation modeling on, on track so that we've got uh, a common benchmark to do our, all our modeling and simulations from. Hollow freight wheels, yep, we know that's a, one of our biggest problems. Difficult to cater for and, and might lead to premature failures in places. How do we manage that going forward? That's a big question. P1 impact forces as well. We don't always consider them or account for them in the design process. So we need to understand them better and know what we're actually seeing. Uh, I know lots of measurements are being taken at the moment. So hopefully that will um, better steer that work. And one thing that, that I think I've seen over the last three years is, is this um, becoming more popular to do multi-body simulation. So we're looking at it from, from the support structure right up to the rail. Um, so there's there's lots of work being done on that. And hopefully we're going to use it within, within the network rail standards as well. So if we can gain some knowledge from that on, 
on loadings and, and how we should design track for the future, then hopefully we'll be using that with our network rail track standards in the future. And the Jenkins P2 formula, I won't um, try and pretend what that is. I've heard about it. <laughs> um, Jan's better for that one. Um, um, it's uh, something that um, is being looked at now um, and multi-body simulation, as I said as well. So that'll help steer our, um, um, and, uh, our standards for the future. And going forward, so after the NR60 Mark II designs, um, they proved successful. Um, so lessons learned need to be captured through continuous monitoring. And I think getting hold of that monitoring data is what we need to see how it's wearing, how it's performing, what trains are going over it, what loading it's seeing. Um, and then taking this to the NR56 designs as well. And there's some pictures of taking some measurements in the field using a nice 3D scanner. Um, uh, and I think um, understanding bearer joints is a modular bearer joints is a, a next thing that, that we hope to look at. Um, so realistic support conditions that actually do happen in the track and how bearer joints or modular tie plate joints are are actually maintained and, and have we got the design right. Right now I'm going to go into some of the work within work package one um, for the switch switch and crossing um, demonstrators and, and some of the modeling that was done there. So MCL, working in partnership with VAE, um, helped us put together a degradation model for switches. Um, so it's basically task 1.1, an extension of approaches for modeling and simulation of enhanced SSC. Um, <clears throat> so the focus on simulation of the contact loads and the damage mechanisms in switch rails and and looking at um, model-based lifetime assessment. So building a degradation model will help us really know in certain situations, certain load cases, um, certain user-defined um, areas, how it's expected to perform, when we should be replacing, when we should be um, weld repairing or grinding. So it gives us a better, better informed decision on when we should be doing that. Uh, they've done multiple simulations looking at various lateral positions of the wheel set on the approach as we know the approach does affect the um, positioning of the wheel set looking at various different um, angles your angles or, or angle of attacks as well various different switch geometries so a lot of this was done within their, their simulation it's similar to what we might do in vampire but with vampire we might try and impose a, a i guess a, a maintenance possibly a slew or a, um, a misalignment to sort of excite the vehicle slightly and give us some different results to see what would happen if we did a plane with the, uh, the, the alignment ahead of a set of switches. So they, they've looked at um, the contact zone areas and what stresses uh, we're actually seeing and where we're seeing those stresses. So they actually found a two gigapascal stress concentrated area just here within the switch. And you can see that's so defined in such a close proximity in a, a small contact patch. That's why we get breakout because it's in such a small area. It's not loaded over a large area. It's And that's where, depending on the metal type, we might get breakout or we might get some, some lipping forming and so on. Um, now they're doing this so that they can then look at different metal types, different geometry types, different switch types. So having this model then you can then feed into it different geometry, different um, metallurgical properties as well, and then see what would be best going forward. Um, so here's another section of the switch there showing that breakout. And I think what their actual um, modeling showed was, in theory, that's what we get. And those, that's, so they actually proved in theory by some of the site measurements um, using the geometry that went out to the site that they used as the base case, and they found exactly the same scenario. So the comparison showed similar flex, you know, switch valve degradation. So, so that gave them some confidence in in the um, finite element model that they used. Um, so, so they knew they were they could then go forward. Within work package two, we're looking at drones. Um, you're probably aware that Network Rail are using drones to do some of the inspections and to do a lot of surveys at the moment. We're, we're trying to take it the next level further, um, uh, along with Plowman Craven. Um, we're looking at the sort of Vogel R3D system. 
Um, and the main drivers are improving planning, boots off ballast, reduction of elimination of possessions and line blocks and the need for protection for staff. Um, and for s &C, we're looking at some of the basic visual inspection types you do. So BVI, um, s &C gauge surveys. So that's when you actually get the gauge out and start measuring flangeways and, and toe openings and residual switch openings. Um, and then there's a prefabrication survey that we would do. So can we use drones for that? And then also to develop the 3D model. Can we use that to develop the 3D model? Um, so that's so we can feed that into a, a digital twin going forward. And um, earlier on, I talked about the demonstrator. This is the technology demonstrator that um, VARS have um, manufactured and installed last month in Lising North, in uh, which is south of Vienna. They've actually installed four turnouts, um, which is more like two crossovers, but you've got a large gap in between. <clears throat> they have, um, in yellow, they have uh, a reference system. So that's the existing design that we use. So there's no undersleeper pad, it's just a concrete bearer, and it's using standard OBB design spec. And then in blue, they have the new spec, the new enhanced SNC. Um, so we've got a direct comparison. Uh, both are highly instrumented, as I'll show you later, and for validation. Um, and I'll take you through the installation photo. So these were provided by um, Christian Ebner from, from VARS. Um, this was the installation back on the 1st of November. Uh, and you may be asking me, what is those blue base plates just there? So to, to enable to gather some information on what lateral forces we see at crossings, these check plates were replaced with instrumented plates so we can actually strain gauge and measure forces within this area of the check rail so we can feed that information back. Now there's other things in here that I'll go through. There's new fastening systems, new check support systems, and new crossing. Um, I'll go through these in detail in a little while. But, but as you can see from the wires and all the monitoring systems, it was heavily instrumented. And then that yellow thing there is uh, an underbearer sensor pad, uh, which gets in a design for this as well. Right, I'll take you quickly through the um, areas that they improved. So starting with the bearer, um, they raked the bearer angle. Um, and if you can see around the nose, the uh, if you were to take the intersection point of the nose between the track, it's actually at um, the center line I'll call of the lead. So it's actually um, at the same angle as uh, the turnout and um, the through route, rather than splaying it to the through route, you know, perpendicular to the through route. So these bearers, Base, they, they gradually rake into this at the crossing and they rake back. Um, they widen the footprint of the bearer, so the bearer end is slightly widened there. Again, through through multi-body simulation and so on, they've looked at stress patterns and where, where support's needed. So each bearer end is widened by, I think, 25 mil each side, um, so it's still tampable. Um, so it's improving that the, the footprint and contact area on the outside. The long through bearers have coupling plates. So, so these coupling plates are different to what we'd call our shroud plate. This coupling plate really ties two bearers together with a resilient coupling system um, that, that allows for four different types of forces um, to occur. Um, so, and I'll go through that in a bit of detail. The information isn't um, that forthcoming because it's going through painting at the moment, but it's still an interesting um, application. And the underbearer pads, have, uh, they've been designed using finite element modeling of the whole system um, because gets no word involved with, with the concrete supplier to look at the support area for the bearer and also with VARS for the stiffness of the crossing and the elasticity of the fasteners as well. <clears throat> so it's, it's a good example of sort of multi-body stiffness model. Uh, the coupling plate. Yeah, I don't have too much on the coupling plate, but it's designed to manage tension at the bottom and normal forces and shearing forces. Uh, it's introduced at the via the crossing where the spread is 500 mil. 
Um, it has three varied stiffness, stiffnesses. So if you can see on the right hand side here, this diagram, it says stiffness one, stiffness two, stiffness three. So as they come off the crossing, we start to go in these separate bearers there. Um, they're varying the stiffness because as we know, long bearers are very stiff. And as you come off from a long bearer onto a short bearer, there is a sudden change in stiffness. Um, so this is managing that stiffness change by having those three uh, three stiffness variations we can then step down transition into what what we call standard sleepers at the rear there um, and that's where we lose a lot of top we get ballast degradation we have to come back and tamp at the back so that's that's really um trying to uh, improve geometry retention really at the back and stop voiding at the back and so on and then we start to get wear and it starts to then come back into the crossing area certainly if you've got joints around there and welds around there it doesn't help as well um let's say the, so the coupling plate softens and supports the stiffness in the long bearer to short bearer zone um there is a cover that's used to stop the ballast spines contaminating the joint and it provides modular designs as well I think only, and I didn't fill that bit in because I wasn't sure of where, where it's used, but currently it's only used in the six foot or in the spread. It's not used in the four foot. So they'll have to really look at using it within the four foot like we do with our modular joints. It's under painting, so it's a bit um, cloaked in mystery as well. <laughs> so as you can see, I've got a photo of it with a cover on, but not with a cover off. <laughs> um, which is a shame we were, we were due to go out to see the technology demonstrator but due to covid we we, we couldn't make it but um i'm sure if we were there they probably would have taken the cameras off us as well but um so they, they looked at the geometrical geometrical deviations of what you might get around those bearers so you get that sort of holding effect and you get the sagging effect and you get that offset of bearer effect at the bottom one here as well so so really that's what the coupling plate is managing, it's managing those, those different modes, those different, um, how, how bearers might rotate and offset and, and um, you know, that uneven settlement as well. So the crossing, um, the crossing design um, was structurally altered. We've got um, continuous um, flange or continuous foot, which is something that's, that's been around now for probably five or six years. Um, so that's been adopted um they haven't done any changes to the profile here so we're hoping to team up with huddersfield and work done there so for interact three we have a um a new structural design with a new profile as well but i don't think they want to change too much in one go the legs are 400 ht so we've got quite hard legs which going into an edh of say 330 350 gives you that hardness change um so it's slightly less than than with 260 hardness um they've also designed the fastening system around this to, to sort of co um to complement the, the crossing and under bearer pads as well designed as i said um and yeah no change in profile the switch design is an interesting one it uses r400 ht that diagram on the right hand side shows you the the variation zones from the heat treatment process and how you've got a 400 at the top sort of starts to go down to like a 380 360 370 as you go down the web um so lots of people might say that is very hard you know we've got 350 on cross rail and uh hp is 320 but it is just the head that's treated not the rest of the body rest of the part so we've got standard um 260 elsewhere um now one interesting thing and yeah for, for the, the main reason for going for hd is, is the wear resistance and resistance to rcf and, and they've modeled this also within the the design so they've looked at um, how wear and lipping may occur and so on to try and try and eliminate that this um this switch profile uses a 60 e1 apd so it's actually nine mil thicker so if you look at this diagram on the bottom left here We've got a rail foot that's 29 mil deep as opposed to 20. So the Sen 60 normal rail was 20 mil. This is 29 mil, so it's quite meaty. Um, it's also got a wider foot. So Sen 60 E1A1 is 140. This is 165. So overall, this is quite a chunky piece of steel. Um, now, what that's helped us do, um, so it's improving the stability. Um, but what it's also done is helped uh, improve the detection of obstructions within the switch. Because it's a lot stiffer, 
we're able to detect obstructions along the whole switch plane length a lot better. So it actually removes the need for further detection further down that you might require for, for um, switch obstruction detection, um, which is a good side effect uh, along with the stability and so on. Now this is teamed up with, so uh, it's incorporating a 7.5 mil inset stock rail. So the switch sits snugly in the 7.5 mil um, stock. It's not joggled, it's inset, so it's switch isn't actually joggled over, it's it's got um, material removed. Um, so again, that's to reduce RCF, it's all been modelled. It's a similar approach to what Huddersfield have, have been using with their inset switch design. Um, and all rails actually in the layout are R400 HT as well, so the, the, the legs of the crossings and all other filling rails are as well, um, except the check rails, they use a, a 350 chromium grade for that as well. Um, so there's the new switch profile. On the bottom right is the inset switch design, and that, that diagram there gives you an idea of the sort of the, the hardness changes you get um, in the steel. Fasting system. Um, again, design, design multi-body. Uh, there's no direct fixation here. It's all passive. It's, it's all from one to another, so you don't have anything passing through any um, any resilience of the system, which is Good thing to have. Um, you've got an internal, so you see the uh, the pink pad there, that's varied stiffness pad that we can change the stiffness on. Um, we've got this clamping arrangement that clamps the base plate on top of the pad and then gets screwed down through these. So there is a lot of screws there, um, but what you're doing is you're not passing the rail stresses through any of these fastings, it's going straight, straight down to that. So you're actually clamping it down on top. Um, and then you've got some side posts there, which give you that lateral protection within. Um, then you're using a sort of standard SKL type clip there as well with the T-bolt arrangement there. Um, so we can then alter the pad stiffness. Um, you know, our first, I think our first impressions were there's lots of kit there. And I think within R60 and other designs, they, they've learned mistakes or they've learned from the hard way by having lots of complicated kit. But um that's part of our maintenance review that we're going to do that, you know is is there too much there to go wrong um does it work in 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 that maintenance mode and and how effective it is so you can see the, the pictures here on the bottom left you've got four there on each one so certainly around the crossing and there's also a new check plate which has six bolts going through and that's a different grade rail in there as well so it's an independent check plate um, but it's um, so then we can control the stiffness of the running rail going through um, by having it independent. Um, I know when you twin the system up, one moves with the other, um, but then you have a difference in clip type as well. So you really try and sort of have a, have a consistent clip type and so on. So um, and stiffness of the lateral stiffness. So so that helps with that. And now that big yellow thing. So that's that's the Getzner underbearer pad sensor. Um, it's a, a pad that's uh, installed underneath the bearer, and it gives us the support um, pressures against the ballast. Um, so it gives a direct measurement of pressure distribution underneath the sleeper. Um, so you see that little diagram, the black diagram, which which looks like um, little mountain peaks on there. So you can see the red peaks are obviously where we're getting very direct contact. So it gives us an idea of what, what, where we've got um, made possibly some voids and what the actual contact pressures are as well. Is it uniformly distributed? Is it just in one area? Is it very low? Is it, is it a hanging bearer? Um, so that will give us, give us some, um, some indication of that. And it's right under the nose where they've installed that as well. So um, along with other sensors, um, it's tampable. They, this is about two years old, this design. They've used it with sleepers already. Um, and they can leave it in the track for long-term data recording. They're looking at a system that you can actually deploy yourself, so if you wanted to put it on some certain areas where you've got problems, but um, we're certainly looking at this technology to be an embedded system rather than a, uh, you know, a, a transportable measuring device. Um, so, yeah, so we're in a way we're using this to validate our crossing design, but we're also validating the bearer sensor as well. So that'd be an interesting one. <laughs> Um, I won't dwell too much on the POE side. We have a, a new mechanical supplementary drive. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's called a um, 
PSD, a polygon setting device. It's got two bars that push and pull rather than one bar. Um, and then you've got mid mid uh, units to, to push out. Um, they're not, there are no stretcher bars on this. Should be good glad to know. It's either using drive bars or direct drive from the P, um, the uh, what is a mechanical back drive really. Uh, the Sphera Lock. This is a VAE design. It's, um, it's a lock and drive rod. Uh, it's not a stretcher bar. And it's really the interface between the point machine and the switch rails. So it's used to sort of transfer, transmit the forces from the point machine to the switch rails. Um, it has some overload, no rail overload protection in there. Um, it's got a locking device within it as well. So the locks within that device itself. Um, it's tamperable, it can go in an in-bearer, so you can tamp around it. Um, um, you can also use it for movable point frogs or movable crossings. Easy installation, machine tamperable, encapsulated components. Um, yeah, low cycle cost. So yeah, this is Ross Dalpine um, uh, that are trying to obviously, but they're, they've had this system for the last three years, um, but this is a next generation. Um, of the Theralock, so it's used in combination with with the whole ALD system. So, and there it is, there mounted on a hollow bearer. So you've got that 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 sort of thrust bracket frame, if you like, similar to what we have for um, for clamp lock. Um, you can see these brackets here on the bottom left. You've got a slot there, so that's allow allowing for thermal movement. So we've got drive that allows for thermal movement and a connection between the rails that allows for thermal movement, which is good. Whereas at the moment we've got stretcher bars that connect the two and we may have a drive that has thermal movement, but we still have a stretcher bar that may move up and down, but may clash with something else. Uh, it's trailable, um, applies to some narrow gauges. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, I think it's, it's adjustable basically, so you can use it all down the whole switch length as well. So you can use it at the back and at the front and in the mid. The EcoStar isn't really a new piece of machine, the, the point machine that we're using. You, you may have seen these in in, um, in 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 Europe. It's quite a common machine in Europe. Um, they have got a newer design system here. Um, so they've upgraded the RCM, remote condition monitoring has been updated. Um, and the way that's been integrated with the spare lock and the, uh, the booted bearer and the under, and the sleeper pads for the bearers as well around it is um, is is novel as a, as a modular design. So. Now the switch monitoring system. So that within that they have a switch monitoring system which is called RLM4, um, and it monitors the current, the swing time, the hydraulic pressures where hydraulic is used. That's because also this could be used for electric and pneumatic as well oil levels for hydraulic and also forces so it's measuring the force to throw the rail which for us is good because current is great but current when um, teamed with issues with the switch rail and, and um, uh, alignment faults and other issues around the track support um, you can start to see you having problems but force can then show us yes we're increasing the force at a certain area so we can then see the load path and how it's been actually loaded and, and operated. Um, so yes yeah, so this is a new system. Um, they're, they're also teaming this up with um, what they're calling the intelligent turnout system. So this isn't being demonstrated for into track two, possibly for three, but no we're really looking at this for trying this um, as part of the intelligent infrastructure program where um, VARS are using RC, the, the new state of RCM um, for point machines, along with other sensors at the crossing, uh, within the switch, uh, on the hill and other accelerometers and so on to look at a whole system monitoring so that they, they can then look at the, the whole system failures as I suggested earlier. Now, a lot of a lot of work has gone into how we measure this and how we validate these new designs. Um, so VAE have been working with their um, their partner who does the instrumentation. Um, they've got sensors, so I believe these are accelerometer sensors being installed on the front bearer. Um, and they've also got the Getzner under bearer sensor as well being installed. 
and various other strain gauges. You see the blotted out area in G, that's the check gauge area where they're taking the um, lateral uh, stress readings. And around H, they're looking at the, the whole system stiffness change between the long bearer and the copper plate bearers as well. They've also got some subgrade um, ground vibration accelerometers, so passing underneath the crossing all through the ballast. So we're seeing how then that transfers through to the ballast as well. Um, uh, again, all, all being measured together and, and looked at and analysed as one. Within the bearer pads underneath the, sorry, the, the rail pads underneath the crossing, they've got instrumented rail pads um, with these strain gauges, small little cutouts there. Um, for gauges to be installed within the gets the pad. Um, so they're looking at um, strain gauges, that's a quarter bridge sensor strain gauges in those areas to see what's what's being passed through from the crossing into the bearer. And within the, the, the first drive locking unit, um, there's accelerometers in various different axes, so the green boxes, um, we've got accelerometers on the stock rails, switch rails, and the sparrow lock. Um, and then they've got displacement sensors, so a void meter type thing on the bearer end, bearer ends and the very end of the um, point machine um, support as well. So a lot of instrumentation, a lot of wires there. Um, so yeah, just to sort of go back on that actually. So we're, we're hoping this, this work will finish in 2023, so that's 18 months of testing. We're into track two, we're going to do a mid test report uh, to finalise, and then we'll see how we move this on to into track three following this. Um, any lessons learned and data and information we're trying to feed onto other people as well, so we can use a lot of this data to, to, to feed into some of the new tasks within track three. So it's, it's been a very useful um, demonstrator for us. I'll very quickly go through some of the work that Cranfield are doing. Um, so, Cranfield University, Andrew Starr, and his, his um, Colleagues are working with us on into track one, sorry, into track two, work packages one and two. They're building this um, rail inspection and repair system, um, which is the system on the top there, and then it's mounted onto this repair vehicle. And so this can go up to a rail, um, analyze the rail, and eventually you'll be able to repair the rail as well. So here's a here's the robot arm going up to the rail, and there's the thermography that's that it's recorded. Um, so this is really part of our um, uh, autonomous inspection and repair processes we're looking at. So we're trying it for plane nine and then for, for S&C, we're also trying to adopt sort of CNC processes so it can actually um, repair crossings to the correct profile. And we're also looking at the, the, the actual rail deposit type use because we're looking at um, new and harder um, deposits that, that we can then improve, uh, improve the wear of um, durability. Uh, so yeah, so they're they're involved with um, our next generation S and C concepts, um, track geometry repair, and they're also involved with remote monitoring of rail defects and autonomous ultrasonic testing as well. So feeds into all of the interactive work. Um, so that pretty much runs it together. I know it's very quick, um, and I'll probably get lots of questions, um, but. Um, you know, th this was a collaboration. There was lots of people that were mentioned in this. I know in the article in uh, in October, um, we had those partners for S-Code mentioned, um, and University of Birmingham really, really have been good there for us. Um, and they were there from S-Code start, and they're still with us with various um, uh, different um, projects at the moment, which is good, mainly on the instrumentation side, um, and also on the Repoint project, which is the new switch point, which is which is involved in work package two. Um, uh, University of Huddersfield, uh, Cranfield, Sheffield are helping us as well with friction, rail friction and rail coatings. And Vostalpine have helped us quite a lot, um, Railinium and SNCF research, as well as OBP. So, so that's just acknowledging all of those guys um, for their help and their support over the last years. Um, and really, that is about it. Um, so I was going to open up to, to Mike uh and to any questions and there's my email address as well if you want to badger me um strictly work stuff please though um mike are you there yeah yeah okay so i think i've got a first question i don't know if you can see it. uh 
Darren, so the first one from Daniel Mahoney. Is the 9mm thicker switches to allow for more grinding? And are you looking into new welding repair process for the HTT rail? Um, so the 9mm thicker is all about stability. Um, yes, there is some more meat to the bone, so you're right. And the fact that it's an inset switch means you've automatically got more rail material at that um, transfer area. So you've already got an extra 9mm there, um, with it being 7.5mm um, inset. And the the wider foot, it's more on the foot because obviously we'd have to machine the head still. Um, so it's it's more about um, sort of stability uh, in that sense. It will affect the sort of the, the flexural performance of the switch, but because we've got uh, SO devices and actuation devices that we can locate that, that up and down the switch, um, we've got more confidence with that. But but um, yeah, so I suppose by making it wider. Then you've you've got more thickness and, and um, you've got more to go before you start to wear. So um, there is that part. And on the weldability side, I know with um, 350HT there were still concerns about weld repair. Um, in most of Germany and Austria, they don't do weld repair. Um, and their philosophy is well, if you're making us a switch that's harder wearing, then we'll just manage it through grinding um and we shouldn't have to weld repair and it's also a thicker section it's also an inset switch it's, it's shown and proven to to work longer so so i suppose they're applying those 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 philosophies and, and that thought process I guess. all right next question i've got is from brian johnson saying you touched briefly on hard wearing switch coatings that va are also involved with can you advise how advanced these trials are and if there's a possibility of trialing it on london underground ah hello brian i just see your name pop up so you're you're probably aware of the alpha tech trials that that um lu started and network rail also started um so that that's also going to be assessed but we're, we're looking at similar similar coatings so it's different sort of metallic compounds some of them may be sprayed some of them may be thermally or cold cold applied um and um we've put together some i guess some requirements and one of my requirements i put out there straight away was well we need to be able to apply it on track because to wait for new switches, we could be waiting 10, 15 years. So um, can we have a process that we can apply on track? So on existing in situ switches, we come out and we take a possession or we do an engineering hours and we apply within three hours, we apply the new coating over. And it's just over the, the, sort of the contact, the main the start of contact and towards the end. So you're only talking varying lengths of like one to three or four meters. Um, and they're looking at coupling that with a low friction surface. Uh, and also possibly with, with if we need a lubrication system to keep it low friction, then do we need to have a lubrication system nearby or does the coating itself give you a low friction? Because some, some tungsten carbides, some other materials similar to that can give you a sort of a low friction to start with. Um, so, so that's what, and Sheffield are looking into that and we're doing some quite detailed um, sort of twin disc tests and, and quite abrasive tests on it. The materials we've got i think about a dozen different materials we're looking at um some of them as uh, grease coatings as well we're looking at so um so that's going to be interesting that that finishes in in august but um i can't see why it can't be applied to lu and i've said before to to, to mike mike barlow lots of this information is going to be available to anyone in the uk um so tram systems and london underground and um tfl as a whole and and to you know to to other uk rail networks it's i think once into track two and three is sort of start to finalize our, our within the uk i think our aim there is to make sure people are aware of the work um share the good work um there may be some things that just aren't going to work you know that maybe they work in some countries but not in ours due, due to maintenance practices and so on so so yeah definitely be sharing it with you brian at some point <laughs> Okay. Next one I've got from Stuart Corey is how have you gone about getting information about long time design degradation in traffic without just waiting for that to happen under traffic and weather degradation of the rest of the track system and effects of maintenance both to the units and the adjacent track? 
Yeah, so so that is a good point, and it it's been our bugbear ever since. It's getting very good, reliable degradation data from existing track components. Um, uh, I speak to so many different, um, I guess, suppliers or designers of of monitoring systems, and they're saying, "Give us the data. Give us the data. What is it? What are the parameters? What is it we need to measure?" What are, so so from from what you have to measure and where you have to measure it is 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 um, area are areas that we're looking into. Um, we've done we've used monitoring um, information from um, work from SNCF and from OBB and from Getzner, some modelling that they've done. Um, MCL did some modelling with VARS uh, initially and into track. Um, Huddersfield have, have been getting some data from Network Rail um, on on modelling, sorry on on degradation. Um, but we do need to be better at pulling together this information. And as soon as the demonstrator went in for the VARS and Vienna demonstrator went in, everybody said, can we have the data? Because they, they need it. And the good thing is this is a clean environment with very set thresholds and also a comparison. We've got the reference sites we can compare to existing design, to a new design. Um, and, you know, a lot of the instrumentation being used is also being trialled as well, the actual instrumentation, to see if, if that could be an embedded sensor in the future or a sensor that we might use. So embedded sensors in crossings, so they're actually internal to the crossing or internal to the bearer, is one thing we're looking at into track two, going into into track three as well. So uh, it all stems into that, but um, whatever data we can get hold of, um, we do, and um, um, yeah, and we have suffered. We have suffered so we and even with failure data as well failure data is another thing so how, how do you prove that it is a problem and what's the cost of that problem and what are the benefits that you're introducing in, in sort of financial terms um so yeah yeah it until we get better ways of of managing the data and and i would say a standardized data set management system to bring it all together um then uh, and there is there is a project called intersmart that's doing that um, and it's within um, uh, Shift to Rail, and we're we're using some of their data that they've got on board train data that we're using, and they're also in, introducing some wayside and trackside data acquisition units for for various to, to look at the comparison between the two. So, uh, yeah, I hope that's answered that question. Was there a second part to it as well? I think that was most of it. <laughs> uh, one from Mike Barlow, which is how can people obtain updates on these projects that you've described? Um, by looking out for the next PWI journal. <laughs> right. I would. You're right. It's difficult. Um, I don't think it's very well publicised when we have shift to rail. Um, we have an we had an innovation seminar about three weeks ago, um, and even the people within Intertrack Two didn't know it was on. You know, so they don't get very well publicised. Um, so I think S code was well publicised initially with Birmingham when they did the completion, but cert certain um, certain parts of the output weren't that publicised. So I think within Network Rail, we've 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 said we need to be sort of making people aware of this, what's being introduced, what the what the technologies will be, whether they work or not. This is what we're looking at, uh, and then because that market readiness relies on people seeing these products and going, I'm happy to trial that. And, you know, we're using some projects to trial um, certain things, um, which has always been the way because um, they're keen to innovate and use new technology. And if they've got a, also a carbon reduction um, KPI, then, then, you know, we'll help towards that as well. But um, yeah, uh, I think hopefully the dissemination of shift to rail is going to improve. Um, and it's been noted over the last six months that you know a lot of this stuff has just gone around in the background. I mean, a lot of people are aware of it, and there's been a couple of talks at PWIs in the past, but um, sometimes it doesn't go into that detail. But yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a good point, Mike. Yeah, but we can keep regular contact, and through PWI, I can keep regular contact as well. So, right, I've got the next one is from Sean Tarrant, and what consideration has been given to climate change in various research for is it work package two yeah um so in work package two and in work package four new track um we've got environmental um, requirements so within our environmental requirements we've looked at climate change um 
proposals and and looking at where we're going to be in the future so the drainage system is also considering that the um rail stress management so we've got a rail stress management um work subtask which is basically measuring rail stress um, um from the train residual stress or thermal stresses from the train um, so it's a way of being better informed of what the rail is actually sitting out from a stress-free temperature point of view, coupled with the actual you know, ambient and rail temperatures. Um, but um, um, most of those environmental requirements are really forecast and where we're going to be, and where we should, where we think we should be. You know, even even looking at our structures as well is is a big concern. So there is there is part of shift to rail there is an environmental part of that project that looks at that and and studies what what should be used and how we should be managing it in the future in terms of climate change and network rail are also robert and poma who's done the pwi talk before he's doing quite a lot on um certainly on track categories do they need to change um do does our sft range uh, does our sort of stress free temperature and, and our sft and our actual stressing range have to change are we going to go up to 28 degrees in the next two years? Um, so those sort of things are being looked at, um, not not only from a climate change, but also from how you want to manage the risk in terms of rail buckles versus rail brakes, you know, cold hot stuff. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. But yeah, it's, it is being um, considered as part of this, sure. Right, I've got another one from Richard Brown. Is How is leaving the EU going to affect funding? Well, it does. It does affect it. And it's going to be crunch time over the next few months. Um, currently, we've agreed to continue. Um, and the next talks on Intertrack 3 means that, that our involvement, uh, there is still an involvement from the UK. I mean, um, Network Rail have been managing two, well, I'd say they've been managing 50% of the workload for Intertrack 2 in plain line and SNC. And and also within the UK, within the universities in Ukraine. Um, but going going forward into Intertrack 3, we're now um, looking at the resources for Intertrack 3, who's doing what. Um, so they will secure funding and they will secure contracts um, for that funding until 2023, based on what is currently known, you know, with us leaving the EU. So we are still there and there's still be money there for us. And they, that that portion of money that, that's required for, for the UK and network, well, network rail to manage um, a lot of those subtasks is, is still going to be there. Um, it will probably, they'll probably need to look at it in terms of government governance of it, how it's governed. Um, so, um, and anything else that might affect it. But, but the good thing is we're securing work up to 2023 that will have what will be agreed funding as well. So watch this space. Right. We've got one from Philip Ramson. Is any consideration being given to maintenance regimes and access and the effect this has on reliability? Yeah, it, it, it does feel so. One of Network Rail's tasks is to look at all of these technology demonstrators and the new developments. And we have to do a validation of those new processes, whether it's a design, whether it's a, an inspection regime, you know, using the drones, with it. and we have to then validate how that will be um, employed within our current maintenance systems. Um, and then we've got to think also in the future, what will our asset management strategy be in terms of how we maintain? So we're now considering um, the requirements for asset management plan and asset management of the asset in terms of um, what the new asset will be, what the frequencies of inspection will be in the future, because there'll be few and far between as capacity increases and so on, um, how we can get automated inspection out there. Um, and there is gonna be a shift change. And I think, um, I guess a lot of it's about changing behaviors and changing the way we currently look at it um, and adopting, I guess, you know, a more modern approach to the certain things where we can, but it's not gonna be easy, you know, because. Um, certainly for tamping, so you look at tamping cycles and, and grinding cycles. So in the future, we look at those hopefully being reduced because we're going to improve um, track stability and design. Um, so in that case, you know, we won't need to have so much access to track. Um, so track access and track um, availability will, will improve. Um, and it's, it is about reducing staff on the ground. 
Um, but we're going to be a, a data hungry. I think we're going to have lots of data and we still need the people to analyze that data and use that data properly. And that's that's the problem at the moment. I think we've got lots of data, but we don't know what to do with it or how, or how to apply it. Um, yeah. I've got one from Mike Barlow. You commented that long bearers give us stiffer truck support than shorter bearers. Has there been any investigation on how this change of stiffness could be managed through different different stiffnesses of under sleeper pads? Yeah. So get get all already aware of this on certain designs of S and C with under bearer pads, and they know that as we get to the longer bearers they may under those long bearers they may put three different pad types so the outer bearer so the inner section will have a different pad to the outer section you have those a b c so three different stiffness types so getson are already aware of that and they're managing it at that bearer to ballast sort of contact level um which what you got to think of is is above that there's more work happening it's going into the bearer and what the bearer is then doing back up to the rail and, and so on. So in terms of ballast degradation and geometry sort of lower down, the, the, the underside pad can help with that. But, but, but by understanding it from the top and around the rail and then into the bearer and then not actually transferring those loads to, to the underside of the bearer anyway, in the first instance, then you're going to stop it, you know, from, from, from that load path down. Um, the Getzner already do um, a three part undersleeper pad stiffness um, around those areas so they can they can model that and a lot of the time it's down to if, if you if you want that or if you want just one stiffness la layer um, um, so get and get gets now have been modeling and I think they've got a lot better with modeling and this this under bearer pad sensor is going to give them a lot more confidence in what they're doing as well um, to give them a you know, good validation of their their designs as well because that's, that's what they've lacked in the past is validation from their from their designs and under bearer pads have been around for like 20 years and they're, they're still learning. Yeah. Okay, another one from Mike is switch inspections using existing manual gauges are difficult for people carrying them out. Which systems might be available in the next few years to make this easier and hence more reliable? Um, so the trial of the drone is going to give us some, some confidence in the, the accuracy. At the moment, the drone can do a 3D image of a switch rail. So imagine you wanted to do a mini prof or a detailed image of a switch rail um, or the crossing and you want to then do some sort of 053, 054 type assessments on that by overlaying sort of wear, wear limits and so on. So it, in the future, the drone will have the ability to do plane line pattern recognition so we can look for things that are missing. It will look for, um, it can also measure the profile of the rail. It, it's then measuring wear as well as the sort of safety limits which we use gauging for them. at the moment we do not even measure wear of switches we just measure it against the safety exceedance level so it's going to give us an idea of where it's wearing and how it's wearing the same with the crossing um, so that's one way um, we're into track one and two are still looking at sort of felix robot felix so that's that's the the um the robot trolley mounted system that pushes around um we're also as part of um, II intelligent infrastructure putting plane line pattern recognition for S and C. It's already already on Great Western for plane line, but for, um, for S and C, where we're looking at those types of um, basic visual inspection types that you that you need to um, pick up. But what what we need to understand at the moment is what what can we do with current technology, and where do we still need to use um, human intervention? like detecting a crack. At the moment, there is no system that can detect a crack to the accuracy of the human eye um, that we know of and that we've trialled. But the trials for the drone, were we, we've got, we know we can get to a one mil accuracy when flying at a height of say five metres or four metres to about 1.5, two mil accuracy, sorry, um, which might not be good enough, but it may be good enough just to say, okay, um it's way within it's in the middle band we don't need to go there for another six months or four months you know so it can give us some yeah. some level um so yeah there is there's lots of tools being looked at i've got more from brian Dunmore. have you looked at anything similar to the bunny switch that was a concept back in metronet days oh yeah well there's two different designs at the moment that are quite similar to that. There is the Wiras system, which is um, it's more a gap filler that fills the flange gaps. 
and it's you being um, developed for places where they have snow, uh, snow build up in Sweden and so on. But, but the I guess the nearest thing to it may be the repoint system, which is which where the the, the rails hop into um, hollow bearers and with with um, they've got um, uh, sort of a couple system where with a cam that drops in into position, so it hops into the the normal route or the um, the turnout route. So that's probably a, a very very similar system. And repoint. So I didn't do any slides on repoint, and you probably saw it. It was in PWI before, and we talk about it a little bit in in the PWI magazine. Um, and repoint is probably the nearest thing to it, but it, it does have a sort of stub end. So if you think of where the the stock fronts are, it's still got to drop in to um, a gap. And if those rails that are the, at the front are moving, or if that gap is not well maintained and managed, then you're going to have lots of problems there. So that that's one of our biggest risks. Um, but it's similar to the to that to that bunny switch that I remember. Yeah. Uh, probably one last one from Sean Tarrant. It sounds like the SNC for the future is heavier. So will the changing concentration of energy ahead of the fronts be considered? It it will be heavier and it'll probably be bigger and it be it will be more expensive compared to today. Um but because we're looking at a 60 year or 50 year life as opposed to 25, 30 year life, um, then we can demonstrate over that. But but in terms of um, um, how it manages those loads, I mean, in some cases we don't need to have the weight to manage the loads and manage, you know, certainly lateral restraint, we can manage that in certain other ways and so on. Um, and we're looking at composite materials and lighter materials. It could be that you don't have a rail section in the future. What you have is a, a slender beam that doesn't need to have the metal where it has the metal at the moment, but it has a running surface where which is in you know which interfaces with a wheel, and then it it, it directly fastens itself to a continuous support. So that, that, they're things we're looking at for plane line tracks. So we're looking at new novel um, uh, track support systems as well, and whilst doing that, we're considering it for S and C to see could that be uh, a future support system so we're trying to divide it up i suppose into the kinematics you know the switch moving um how the switch moves and then we're looking at the stable support structure um how we can make it stable um because some of these systems are going to be actually designed for use on ballastless or slab track systems as well and we've got to have that sort of capability to be able to do both um, ballast and ballastless so one of our sort of compatibility requirements is that the system works for both if it's a system that only works for one, then you know it's it's going to be pigeonholed and only used in certain areas. But um, so we've got quite a lot of work streams that are sort of working together in tandem and looking across and saying, okay, I've got this new support system here. It's it's plastic, it's resilient, it's lightweight, it's modular, um, and it can be installed a lot easier, a lot quicker, as opposed to a system that's very heavy, very um, carbon rich. Um, and um, unmaintainable as well. So, so yeah, Sean, have I asked that question? It's gonna, it is gonna become heavy. The heavy question that was. <laughs> I think, I think, Darren, if, if everything's heavier in the SNC, then the, the immediate approach to it becomes the weak spot. Ah, right. So, right, gotcha. Transitions. Yeah. So, so, ahead, so just ahead of the front, the last ten minutes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You you could o you could over design this S and C, and then you've got some very poor track. You know, a nice bit of bullhead leading up to it. What's the point? Um, you know, you you you're going to actually deteriorate that 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 head panel straight away, aren't you? So, so the the transition transition zone projects are looking at our section that we're that we're actually designing within the S and C. Um, then it's going to be compatible with plane line track systems, so new train line, plane line track systems and new s &C. then it's going to be compatible with existing systems as well. And where it's not compatible, we need to have a, a transition design that's prescribed so you can go from one to the other without introducing those weak spots. Um, so yeah, some of this s &C, you might say you can't go from bullet into next generation s &C because you're going to need like a 30, 30 meter transition. 
um, you know, in some cases it could be, but if it was SIN 60 rail concrete sleepers, fast clip, you know, 300 mil ballast under sleeper pads going into this next generation S and C, yeah, that's that's doable. Um, but configuration is our biggest nightmare. It's it's how how we tie into all these different track forms. And then of course, sure, we could have um, you know direct fixed track going into ballasted track with S and C in the middle uh, and structures. So there is one whole, um, it's called Transone, I think, and it's a project that Leeds University are looking at for us. And we've got transition designs to being done. Um, Huddersfield are doing a lot of work on sort of um, transition stiffness and so on. Southampton are doing a lot of work with us as well on the asphalt track with Ben Lee. Um, we've got some instrumented transitions now so we can see what loads we're actually getting um, uh, so we can see what we get in those sort of changes in, in those uh, in those areas so it help us design it better and as, as modeling becomes better when we get better at um, um, doing multi multi body models and so on um, but but validating that with with real demonstrators is our biggest one so um, we hope to put a section of track like 200 meters in in, in Sweden of a new um, continuous support system. Um, and for into track three, we're looking at demonstrators for new tracks. So we'll be looking at those transitions as well. And Cranfield will have a, I think, a 200 meter long siding to do some trials in as well. Um, not really a dynamic trial or test, but more about railway environment and seeing how it works and rising and other things, you know. But um, yeah, you're, you're right. I think compatibility with the, Longitudinal interfaces, I would call it, is, is a is a big concern for us, and, and that agreeing that rate of change of stiffness as well. Okay, thank you very much, Darren. Can I call on Paul Ebert if you're there to do a vote of thanks? Hi, well, okay, Darren, thanks for that. Uh, great talk, thanks very much. And uh, you mentioned uh, no transition from ballasted uh, from bullhead to uh, modern S and C, but that you are the transition from bullhead to modern S and C. Darren. You yeah. are the very man. And but from that very it. yeah, from that very first job when we worked together at Piccadilly Circus, cross over there in bullhead yeah. in the good old tube yeah. tunnels. And what an insight to the current technology that you've given us tonight. Thank you very much. And what a complex system. This is a true yeah. complex railway system uh, that the uh, for on the permanent way. Uh, so fantastic with all the materials, the interfaces, stiffness in pads, uh, and all, all formation stiffness. Fantastic. It's not in um, of the track operatives that we're looking at uh, going to be maintaining this. And Phil Ransom correctly, uh, rightly picked on the maintenance aspects going forward. I mean, you're talking about 40 years here. I won't be here in 40 years. I'm going to make sure that my boys see this talk, uh, Darren, because they're the people who are going to have to look after this and do the maintenance in the future uh, and that's mm. going to be another challenge not in um, technicians we're going to need is it it's true engineers on the maintenance side and that's where the PWI with your help and others here on this call can encourage engineers in, uh, to be uh, registered through the PWI I had to get that in didn't I so thanks very <laughs> much Darren thanks no. very much anyone wants to unmute and help me uh, applaud Darren on a great evening thanks thank you Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Thanks. 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 Uh, our next meeting is.